Lord have mercy, look at how the time goes. Seems I'm so much older. And welcome, everybody. This is the next episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. I am, of course, your host, John Allen. You're a resident American who is lost in Norway. Someone help me, please. Uh, <laughs> my next guest, I want to introduce this guy. He's a great guy. I love him to death, and I'm sure you guys will too. This is Carl Peter Somerset. Hello, Carl. Hello, John. Very nice to be here. Very nice to have you here. Um, we were talking very briefly uh, before we went live. We were talking about uh, nothing is off limits, but if I ask you something you don't want to answer, you'll just tell me you don't want to answer. So let me ask you, what color is your underwear? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You're assuming that I wear underwear. Ah, uh, shame on me. <laughs> shame on me. I'm actually wearing a pink shorts. Hey, you know, it, it happens. Yeah. It happens. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, we, um, I've known about you for quite some time. I saw you, uh, for those of you who don't know, Carl Petter Somis, that is a Norwegian national champion powerlifter. You were a Western European champion as well, correct? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And what place did you come in for the world? Didn't you come in? I think that was about six yeah. place, I think, yeah. So we're talking about a world-class top-level uh, power lifter here. Uh, I remember the first time I saw you lift, it was at the Norwegian Championships maybe a couple of years ago. And I'm like, this guy is strong. <laughs> <laughs> this thank guy you, is thank you. but above him but above him but i'm sorry what'd you say i'm trying my best so well you know your efforts are successful you're very strong uh you're a norwegian champion you're a world-class level powerlifter but above and beyond that and what i think most importantly is you're a nice guy <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah yeah you know you you have always had a very friendly uh online presence uh, I remember I reached out to you on Instagram and just out of the blue, just introduced myself and told you I was an admirer of your, of your powerlifting. Um, yeah, I can remember. Yeah, yeah. I really, yeah. It was a, such a nice thing to do. Well, you know, that's the way I am. That's my mother's fault. <laughs> she raised <laughs> me to be like that. So blame, blame her. <laughs> it's something we have in common. My mother really raised me as well she's a fantastic human being so yeah you know we are lucky guys who are not uh so masculine that we cannot give all of the praise to our mothers so yeah right. um i have to ask you how's your foot <laughs> remember the foot? <laughs> <laughs> my foot is uh, fully healed and uh, really good <laughs> this was this was what maybe a week before the norwegian championships we met yeah, it was we met for the first time at the gym and you had a, uh, now I'm going to blame you. What were you doing? Yeah, holding a glass, a glass water bottle. Yeah. And we went to shake hands and I don't know if it was me being uh, clumsy or if you lifted the same hand that you had the bottle and all of a sudden I bumped your bottle and down <laughs> to the floor it went. <laughs> it, was, it was only my own fault. No one else. <laughs> so clumsy. Oh gosh, I was so embarrassed. I was, and then the blood everywhere from your foot getting cut. But it wasn't that bad, though. So that wasn't that bad. Was just a little cut. Oh my gosh, I was worried. <laughs> I finished my training, no problems. So yeah, you did. I yeah, to be the Norwegian champ afterwards. Yeah, yeah. because that was that was like the last week before the championships, right? I think so. Maybe ten days before something, or something. like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you, it was very impressive watching you. Uh, I think you had squats that day, or at least that's what I saw before I had to leave. But uh, just watching you squat, I'm like, I know this guy is gonna, this guy is gonna kill it at uh, <laughs> at the, at the <laughs> national really championship. Nice thing to say from your one of the greatest squatters here in Norway. So to get ah. that compliment from you is yeah, it's heartwarming. Ah, thank you, thank you. Well, it's it's it all, it's all about mutual respect, and that's what I love about the powerlifting world. We don't have, mm. we don't have, at least to my knowledge, we don't have those ugly rivalries that you see in, in other sports. You know, everybody pulls for the other person and everybody wishes the other competitors well, regardless. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah I, I love it. Really, really enjoy it. And I, I've, I'm the first one to go and cheer for my competitors. Yeah. If they are stronger than me on that day, that's motivating for me because then I have to work even smarter and harder for the next time. So if, yeah. yeah, no, I was going to say that is exactly the way I look at it. I don't, uh, I don't get angry if someone else is stronger than me. I just try to get stronger. 
Yeah, that's the only thing you can do. <laughs> that's the only thing you can do. Yeah. And, the, and the camaraderie and the way we cheer each other on is just very uplifting. I, I, I love it. Um, I find myself, uh, I'm not one who goes in the past and regrets what I used to do in the past very often, but I do wish I had started with powerlifting a lot sooner than I did. I started in 2015, so I've only been doing this for five years, but I just love it. It's just, it's the best <laughs> yeah, sport in the world. Fantastic. I started when I was about 25, so I, I kind of wish I started a little bit earlier myself. But And how old are you now? I'm 34. 34, okay. Yeah, so I've been doing it for about nine years. Okay, yeah. Now you, how long did it take for you to go from that new beginner phase before you started to rank high up in the Norwegian rankings? I have to think a little bit. Um, um, took me about four years, maybe, to before I realized, uh, oh, I'm, I might win something. Yeah, I might be national champ someday. So yeah. You know, and when you say that, when you say four years, I think of how, unfortunately, a lot of young, uh, not necessarily young powerlifters, but young people who are trying to uh, get into better shape, they're so impatient. They, yeah, they really are. They get in the gym and they want those results immediately. And here you're talking about how you trained for four years before you started to kind of realize in your own mind that you could get somewhere with the sport of powerlifting yeah i was motivated from day one but i kind of knew from i've been doing different sports all of my life and i kind of knew to get really good at something you have to work hard and smart over a, a given period of time and it takes years to be really great at something okay Even so now you... after nine years i still feel like a beginner sometimes and uh, oh absolutely yeah the learning never stops never stops so you had never so you had a athletic background that you were able to transfer into the powerlifting world now what was your athletic yeah, it's background? really helped me a lot what did you do um i've done ev i've done everything <laughs> <laughs> uh, i used to be uh, i started skateboarding when i was really young oh yeah Oh, no. Here we go with a bad internet connection. Um, I played rugby. I've done climbing all for several years. I've done athletics, uh, running. Just a lot of things, but that's kind of the things uh, I've done the most. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, really uh, versatile. I've done a lot of things. I used to run a lot uh, when I'm thinking. I'm thinking about that. It's kind of strange now. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I don't <laughs> run uh, uh, that much. I'm I'm too heavy. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say I can't I can't picture you with those squatters' legs uh, running. <laughs> That's just not the picture that comes to mind. Oh. Are you there? Hey, you Hello. know what? We are getting bad connections here. Let me. Let me hang up and just call you on a regular phone call. We won't be able to see each other, but I think we're going to have a better connection. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's yeah, do no worries. Let's do that. Sorry, people. That is just the way it is. Ever since this uh, coronavirus and all of the um, and all of the uh, people sitting at home here in Norway, the connection, the internet connection, has just been awful. So I'm coming off of Skype with Carl Petter, and I'm going on to a regular phone call. So the sound will be good and unbroken. I just won't be able to see him. I'm back. There we go. Okay, the sound, <laughs> the sound is just as good, but I just won't be able to see you. But at least my listeners will have good sound now. Yeah. yeah, that's an important thing. Yeah, there's just been problems here at my place with uh, the internet. Ever since the uh, coronavirus and everybody being on lockdown, maybe it's because there's higher internet usage or something, but it's just been bad, uh, bad connection. So. Yeah, even here in Oslo, I've sometimes noticed that uh, the quality of stuff on the internet is... Yeah. Uh, I think they deliberately uh, put down the quality on Netflix and all the shows because of all of the traffic. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, something is definitely going on because it's been terrible internet connection. Mm. Um, 
but anyway, what I, what I was saying was I can't, I can't picture you with your squatter's legs being any kind of a, a runner in track and field events. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be, uh, I think the same as you. I used to be enlisted in the army and military. Yeah. I was in the U S Marines. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to do a lot of, um, a lot yeah. of running uh, to work yeah. uh, where I where I used to work in the army. So yeah, no, I uh, I try the best I can to forget all the running we used to do in the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> Same with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to be actually. I was uh, I played American football and I was a uh, running back, a tailback, believe it or yeah. not. So I was one of the faster guys on the team. But that was then. <laughs> yeah, same with me when I played rugby. I was one of the fastest guys there. <laughs> because now so. you are in the under 120 kilo class, correct? Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Big big difference from the rugby days. <laughs> yeah, it's a big there's about twenty-five kilos of body weight. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think that uh, I was thinking that I think it's very interesting that you had uh, a rather broad um, athletic background, but you ended up as a powerlifter. What is it that got you interested in powerlifting way back when you first started? Oh, I've always been interested in lifting stuff. Uh, my mother used to tell me stories about when I was just barely walking. The first things I did was picking up the biggest stones I could find and carry them all over the place. Okay. So it started way back then. And <laughs> I've always been really fascinated by strength athletes and strength sports. Okay. Uh, but it wasn't until I moved to Trondheim to study in, uh, yeah, about 2011. Okay. Uh, when I first got introduced to like a powerlifting club, because in the south of Norway, where I'm from, there's no no powerlifters, no nothing. <laughs> yeah, where, 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 where exactly are you from in Norway? A small place called Lingdal in the south south of Norway. That's down by Kristiansand, uh, right? Yeah, it's about an hour's drive uh, southwest yeah. uh, of Kristiansand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it started with this, uh, this childhood obsession of lifting uh, stones and just being fascinated with strength. And, uh, and that's what puts you in the powerlifting world. Yeah, and then I finally yeah, uh, got the nerve to try a powerlifting club. In Trondheim, uh, there was actually, I was looking for a gym to work out because I love training like bench press and bicep and uh-huh. yeah, the usual gym bro stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, by chance, uh, one of the nearest gyms was actually a powerlifting club. Yeah. Uh, a famous, sort of famous Norwegian guy called Einar Gilberg. Uh, he's famous in Norway, at least. Yes, um, he is actually known in the States as well. I have some powerlifting friends who know exactly who he is from his famous naked uh, squat video. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say... Yeah, and, a couple of them. Yeah, and when I say naked, I mean naked, no clothes. Completely naked. On no, <laughs> even on, he was even on Norway's Got Talent or something. <laughs> he asked me, can you please... Uh, spot me and always got talent when I do the naked squat. And I was like, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do not want to be seen hey, as you, someone who's it, squatting naked on national TV. <laughs> if I remember right, nobody, nobody spotted him. He was up there alone, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah. There was a couple of guys, um, uh, a couple of guys there, uh, helping him with the loading. And, but I think the TV crews didn't want anyone else to, s- because of the, uh, uh, safety called, issues but, maybe yeah, the, I, I don't know if the safety but uh, it looked better on camera if he was alone <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah um, it might have been nice to have more in the camera shot to look at other than his um, well I don't know you could say yeah he had balls doing this and he literally <laughs> had balls doing this <laughs> <laughs> yeah he really did <laughs> I really love that guy he, he's uh, uh, I don't know how to put it he's kind of eccentric he's kind of yes. different but uh, I really love him. He's the one who got me into powerlifting. So, very yeah. interesting. Know if, you, if you're hearing this, uh, I really appreciate you. You know, I want to give him a shout out as well. Now, I've never met him. I may have chatted with him once or twice on social media, maybe. Uh, but when I first started thinking about starting powerlifting here in Norway back in 2015, one of the first people <clears throat> that I kind of checked out on social media, YouTube and whatnot, was I not? Um, yeah. It fascinated me first of all how big he is, 
Um, yeah, he was. He was. <laughs> True, and, true. Yeah. Like, and then also he's not that tall, but he was so big. Just a big thick. I mean, he he looks like a power lifter, a classic mm-hmm. power lifter. But yeah. but not only was it his size, but it it was, you know, with me being someone who always, even before I was a power lifter, when I was a bodybuilder, I was always fascinated with squatting. Uh, and I saw how much that guy was squatting. And I believe at that time in 2014, 2015, he was the only Norwegian powerlifter who had squatted over 300 kilos raw. Is that correct? Yeah, he was. He yes. was the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I want to give him a shout out. He motivated me, and I had a secret obsession with squatting more than I not. <laughs> yeah, that's so fantastic. <laughs> well, he he's. Uh, I one of these days I'm going to get to meet him because he just seems like a fascinating, fun guy. Besides yeah, he's being, really, he's really great. Yeah, you know, besides being a being a uh, the powerlifter that he that he is or or, or was, uh, he just seems like a good guy. And everybody I know of that speaks of him speaks of him with, uh, with uh, yeah, in in good regards. He's just well liked by everybody. So, yeah, and it's a fascinating story with him as well. You should probably get him on the podcast. He's probably one of the least talented powerlifters in Norway. Uh, mm-hmm. regarding to powerlifting talent, but uh, his will and his, uh, I don't know how to put it, his um, passion uh, to ah, succeed okay. uh, is was so great. So that right there would be a story that I would be interesting in hearing and sharing with listeners because I love people who... Um, yeah, just as you describe, I who don't have that natural talent, but they actually have to work for it. And even though they don't have the, 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 the natural talent up front, they achieve more than other people who actually do have the talent, yeah, but don't he's work as hard. hard. He's yeah. worked really, really hard for many, 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 many years. So, you know, that's somebody that that's some good advice right there. I'm going to write his name down on my list of yeah, people I want to talk with. Yeah. Now he, um, he has since retired or well retired. Uh, he's not, he hasn't power lifted in quite a while. Uh, do you know why he, uh, he, uh, has recently sort of started a family again okay. uh, and he has moved and he started a new gym. Uh, he's, uh, and he's, I think he's, had some injuries uh, uh, that have interfered with his training. Okay, okay. So you have to ask him, but I think it's kind of he ne- his body needed some rest. Uh, okay. And now he's he's uh, updating every day. He's adding one kilo to his squat okay. every training session. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's coming for uh, he's coming back. I think that's at okay. least what he's trying to do. Okay. I need to step up my game and uh, I can't let him catch me on squats. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's going for the, for the, um, what's it called? Veteran record above 40 years old. How, how old is he? I think he's like 41 or something. Oh, wow. I thought he was older. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, he, uh, I, I wish him all the luck. He's just yes. a, just a great guy and a fantastic lifter. Like I said, just like you, he was the one that kind of you know motivated me to get into powerlifting here in Norway. So that's yeah, a lot of people uh, would say the same about Anna. So it pays off to be a little bit eccentric, to be a little bit loud spoken, to be not afraid to 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 put yourself out there. And and Einar is a perfect example of of that. I think all the powerlifters in Norway, they know who Einar is. At least uh, if they've been doing powerlifting for a couple of years, oh, everybody's yeah. heard of Einar. Yeah, yeah. You don't even have to say his last name. You just say Einar, the powerlifter. Yeah. Everybody knows who uh, that guy is. So. Yeah, and most of the people just call him Gilberg or Gille. Yeah, yeah. His last name. Yeah. 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 What a great guy. Mm. But enough about that great guy. Let's talk about you, the great guy that you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You you have had a very interesting, uh, for me anyway, an interesting journey in powerlifting. Like I said uh, a little while ago, I reached out to you on Instagram. I had seen some of your training videos. Uh, I saw you lift uh, a couple years ago. I believe it was at um, at the uh, Norwegian Championships. When when was it? There was a there was some sort of championship. Was it regionals at uh, Sunda? 
Um, yeah, I think there was, was nationals it? at Sunday 2017, maybe. 2017, right. Okay, yeah. three three years ago. That's yeah. the first time I saw you lift, and I, ju- I was just thinking, I know this guy is going to be somebody. And sure enough, here you are, Norwegian championship, uh, Western European champion, and and uh, fifth or sixth place in, at the Worlds. Um, what was it like to get on that powerlifting platform at the Worlds? Oh, that was amazing. You know, you're uh, there, was, you're representing yeah. your country, and, 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 and there you are at the world. Yeah, it's for me, it's been such an amazing journey. Uh, I decided in uh, Stavanger Worlds in 2013, I was there as a spectator. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew uh, many of the Norwegian lifters because I tra- trained with them every day. I decided then that one day I want to, I want to be the one lifting at a world championship. And so, what, what year was that in Stavanger? That was 20, 2013. 2013. Okay. Yeah. So that was in 2013. And then you got into the worlds at 20, that was 2019, wasn't it? Yeah. 2019 was my first worlds. So you had this vision that you held on to for six years uh, before, yeah. before you saw it happen again, another testament to what patience you have to have if you're going to be successful in powerlifting, it doesn't happen overnight. I, uh, unless you have a really God given talent, uh, it takes, it still takes a lot of time, but yeah, it's, it's um, it's very rare. Really patient. Yeah. Yeah. It's very rare that people, the first time that, you know, that within that first year of competing that they get onto a national team and get to the, to the world. It, it happens, but it doesn't happen often. I'm more impressed by, and I'm not trying to take anything away from those people who, who make it very quickly in powerlifting, but I'm more impressed by the people like you who have a vision over, you know, five, six years or more, and they just stick to it. And then they see, that goal happen. You know, you didn't get first place at the Worlds, but you got to the Worlds, and that is saying quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, and uh, in I've, I've, I always said, like, a f- I always have, like, a five-year plan that I'm working towards. A five-year uh, plan? Yeah, always. <laughs> okay. Uh, I love working towards goals, and uh, I love sort of laying brick by brick, uh, wow. knowing that I'm one brick closer to what I'm trying to achieve brick by brick. See, I knew there was a reason why I wanted you as a guest that, that I'm getting, uh, I'm getting uh, chills down on my skin <laughs> when you say things like that. I am a very, um, I'm very much a <clears throat> person who is impressed by people who have long-term goals. Okay. So you have five year plans. What, what is your, what is your five year plan that you're in right now? It, uh, it was supposed to be the uh, Stavanger World's Championship equipped. That's part of my plan. Uh-huh. But it, it doesn't look like it's going to happen this year because of the coronavirus. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm just waiting to hear that that's going to be canceled. And what a shame that will be. Of course, I, I'm all for it if they cancel it. it. It it has to be done to keep people safe if that's what they decide yeah. to do. But wow, how exciting would that have been to have another World Championship here in Norway? It would be really oh. exciting. It's kind of been my dream. I have, I have, I still have one of the. Uh, I have a little. Uh, what's it called? A little uh, placard in Norwegian uh, poster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- uh, inside uh, my uh, where I keep my clothes inside the cabinet, uh-huh. uh, where my sort of lifetime goals are. Uh, okay. I look at them every time I put some clothes on in the morning. Oh uh, man! It's there and uh, the Stavanger uh, uh, from 2013, uh, the poster is right there next to my next to my numbers. See now, that's beautiful. I also believe in having visual aids to remind me of what my goals are. Uh, mm. For me, it can be you know I do a lot of different things, um, you know, music, powerlifting, whatever. It can be as simple as. Every night before I go to bed, I have to walk through my studio to go to bed. And I love to just look at my guitars, uh, look at my recording equipment as I walk past it and then think, yep, mm. one more song tomorrow, you know? Yeah, I can really relate to that. Oh, the I visual. Really relate to the yeah. feeling, yeah. So, yeah. so every time you open every, every time you open your closet to get your pink underwear, you'll see your... your <laughs> 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 and also I have uh, uh, for me it's really important to eat a lot of food because I have a really uh, my body needs a great deal of uh, fuel to perform 
Uh, I have a really high metabolism, so I need a lot of calories. So on my fridge, there's always a reminder on my fridge on um, that uh, I have to eat a lot and have to eat healthy and good. And yeah, now, now good how food. how structured is your eating program? Do you count calories? Uh, no, I never count calories. Good, I, uh, good. I eat, I eat almost the same every day. <laughs> okay. So, you know, so you know what your needs are as far as your macros, your protein, fat, and carbohydrates, because you pretty much eat the same from yeah, day I, to day. Yeah. But I usually, I var- vary my carbs and, uh, my types of meat. Uh, but yeah. I eat lots of, uh, warm meals. Yeah. Uh, I don't eat bread. Oh, um, you're probably the first Norwegian I've ever known who doesn't eat bread. Yeah, probably. Uh, I love it, <laughs> but uh, my body doesn't respond to to no. great at it. So me neither. Uh, no, so I, I don't eat it because I feel sort of uh, bloated and yeah, yeah. No, I so totally understand that. I uh, I actually got very sick uh, after I moved here to Norway because when I lived in the states, I ate bread and almost. Not at all. It was very rare that I would eat bread. Mm. And I came here to Norway, and there's this big variety of bread. It's easy to find freshly made bread, homemade style bread. So I started eating it, and I didn't know that I was literally poisoning myself. All of that, uh, all of the flour products and the corn products and stuff in the bread was like poison to me. I was just getting sick. I was... Um, constantly itching in my skin. My stomach was bloated all the time and I, d- I couldn't figure out what it was. Somebody suggested that maybe I should stop eating the bread. So I did that and I felt better almost overnight. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I really loved like, uh, I don't know what it's called. Maybe it's called pastry pastries, like yeah. Fre- yeah. freshly baked, like uh, cinnamon rolls. Yeah, and, pastry type of things. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I can't eat it because I feel the way you do if I do. So yeah. I can smell it and I can eat something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you're, if you're, if um, you're, if you're at some sort of, um, arrangement a, a birthday party or something like that you you'll you'll stay away from it and you'll and you'll feel fine about that yeah 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 okay. no worries this is usually an alternative or something yeah so for me it's no problem well that's just... i'm 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 kind of one of the strange guys that uh <laughs> always brings his own food <laughs> you know a lot of people are afraid to do that i hear um I don't do it so much now, but I used to coach people on their, their nutrition. And a lot of people were almost afraid to eat right because they would always say, well, what am I going to say to my friends? What am I going to say to my family? And my answer was, you're going to say to them that you're eating in a way that is best for you. Yeah. And if they don't understand that, then I would have to question their, their loyalty, to, loyalty to you as a friend or as a family member. Yeah, it's the same it's the same thing that I could say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's uh, kind of, for me, it's kind of, uh, especially if I'm close to a competition, like uh, the last, like, for me, close is like the last couple of months. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not visiting anyone. Uh, it's all business. I know what then. they're serving yeah. uh, for dinner. Yeah. Uh, without maybe bringing my own food. and Okay. Yeah. So then <laughs> it's all, of, yeah, it's all business and total focus on what you have coming up. Yeah, because I don't want to not perform at my best. So I don't want to think about, oh, maybe it was that one time I ate some bread and uh, maybe that cost me like one kilo at the meat two years, two months later. Yeah, Uh, you know. It's kind of, I'm I'm a kind of all or nothing guy. I really enjoy the process. I really enjoy the process of kind of, uh, Going, uh, what's it called? Uh, diving in. <laughs> yeah, diving in head first. Yeah, head first. Yeah, like I'm um, doing all the. I'm not. I'm possibly not the one working the hardest at my training. Uh, always, I'm. I'm working hard. Uh, you have to do, but I'm. I'm really focused on doing everything right outside my training. I think that's why I've. I've performed so well for such a long time. That's very interesting that you say that because um, I know a lot of people who are doing the opposite. You know, they're maniacs in the gym, but the weekend comes out and uh, comes up and they will drink themselves silly with uh, gallons of beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I used to do that when I was like 18, 19. Uh, and, and not, not that I have, while. not that I have anything against people drinking, but I guess my point is, is that if you're going to be an elite athlete, if you're going to be a top level athlete, if you want to be that power lifter who gets on the national team and gets things done, you have to, yeah, you know, you have to, you have to close your circle. You can't have any leakage mm. in your program. And that means paying attention, uh, to your nutrition just as much or more than you pay attention to your training. Yeah. And your sleep as well. Restitution, oh, sleep. Uh, doing the things. Yeah. It's so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a creature of habit. So, uh, I usually fall asleep at the same time every night and wake up uh, at the same time. So, <laughs> Well, I tell you, it's, it's very important, you know, and a lot of people will sit back and wonder, you know, how, you know, how do people, how, how does Carl Pett did, do what he does? How does he lift so much? How has he had so much success? How did he make it on the national team? How did he get to the worlds? Well, here's the answers. You know, you, 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 um, you allow yourself to have good habits, not bad habits, but good mm -hmm. habits. You know, you do your training, you do your sleeping, you very much control your diet. And when you put all that together, the, uh, you know, the the sum of all that is success, almost guaranteed success. Yeah, for me at least, it's uh, been a really effective tool, mm -hmm. uh, and it's helped me a lot. Uh, it's given me a lot of confidence on meet day that I've done my sort of preparation to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. So, well, it uh, must be a good feeling. I know um, when I am training in preparation for a competition, you know, I have that same kind of steel focus, that focus that's it's written in stone what I'm going to do for my eating, for my training, for everything. And I just make sure I get it done so that when the competition day comes, I've already done the work. There's nothing to be nervous about. You know, I might get that adrenaline rush and I might be a little bit, you know, wound up and shaky because of that, but I have zero nervousness, no doubt in what I'm going to do. Mm. Because you've done it's the work. Like uh, I think the famous Kirk Kowalski. Yes. Said uh, like it's a few. What I, I can't remember the exact words, but it was like kind of like uh, just do what you do in training uh, for yeah. a couple of seconds. Yep. And don't fuck up, and you'll be all right. <laughs> well, you know, and that, and that's good advice. You know, you do the work during that eight, 10, 12 or 14 week training cycle or those series of training cycles, that's when the work is done. That's when you build your confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a question of doing the work. I always, you know, I don't know what kind of programming you do, but my, my programming, for example, <clears throat> I always make sure, and I, I can't remember the last time I did a single rep in training. Uh, I'm focusing on triples, um, yeah. so that I am very, very sure that I'm going to make my opener very the sure. the most important lift. Absolutely. Very yeah. sure that I'm going to make my second lift. And mm -hmm. then the third lift, I want that to be a guessing game based upon how I feel after the first and second lift. Yeah. But I want to do my training so that I am very sure that I will make the first lift and also very sure that I'll make the second lift. That's what pays off for me. Yeah, that's where most of the beginners kind of screw things up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they want to lift more weight than they're capable capable of. Yeah. And they want to sort of open on maybe their PR. Yeah. And then go from there. And usually that don't, <laughs> that's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I did that um, one time. <clears throat> Um, mm. my first time at, uh, at the nationals, the raw nationals, it was in Oslo. Mm. Um, I had never in training, I had never squatted 300 kilos. Uh, but I opened with 300 that day. And I <laughs> that think that must've been scary. I think, well, it was scary once I went down in the hole and I'm like, uh Oh, this is heavy. Now I got it up. But I think yeah. it was the longest squat in Norwegian history. It, it took, <laughs> you can you can find that it's online on YouTube. You can find it was that. Twenty fifteen. This was in twenty fifteen in Oslo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was inexperienced. It was my I hadn't even lifted powerlifting for a whole year yet, and I had very little guidance. I was yeah. pretty much on my own. I had some training partners at the gym, but the programming and everything was I was pretty much on my own. I didn't really know what I was capable of. 
So that's kind of why I just, th- yeah, I'm going to do 300 today. <laughs> <And> I, got, <laughs> I got it up, but that's the last time that I went to a powerlifting competition without knowing what I could lift for a solid three reps. After that, I made sure that I would get my opener in the second lift. Yeah, well, I have a really good experience uh, with uh, sort of my last warm up lift is my first lift on the platform. Okay, yeah. That's, that's kind of my best advice. Yeah. But then if it's really, really light, you can just add a little bit more kilos than your plan was for the second lift. Yeah. So you're very conservative with your, um, what well, you know, you know what you're capable of for your first lift. Yeah, I know really, really yeah. well what I'm capable of. So, Good. Uh, one, one thing that I see with Norwegian lifters is you guys are very, um, solid and safe in your, in your lifting is very rare <clears throat> that I see, uh, Norwegian lifters of a certain level um, attempting lifts that are crazy. I see a lot more of that in the States, but in Norway, you guys seem to be a little bit more conservative with your lifts. Yeah, um, sometimes we are. I'm, I'm uh, probably one of the least conservative <laughs> in my... <laughs> you maniac. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I have some good stories about that uh, that we can do afterwards. But yeah, it's because we, ha- we have really talented coaches, and really smart coaches uh, that help us. Yeah, who's that? Uh, it's uh, Lars, uh, Lars Somne, Lars who's the Somne, national coach. Yeah. Yeah. Shout yeah, out to Lars. National coach. Shout, Shout out, out to Lars. He's a great guy. He's been coaching me for many years now, and I've he coached a lot you as a progress. junior lifter, didn't he? No, he didn't. I've I've never been a junior lifter, but he was the. Uh, I've never been a junior lifter in. Uh, yeah, power, that's right. Of course, no, yeah, Norwegian of course. powerlifting. Yeah, that's right. He that's was right. the head coach for the juniors when Dietmar Wolf was the head coach for the Norwegian that's national right. team. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then when Dietmar moved on to other stuff, mm. uh, Lars stepped up and. Uh, yeah. Lars is Norwegian a good guy. Powerlifting has developed a lot. Lars is great. Well, he's a good guy. He's very knowledgeable, very well respected here in Norway. Mm. So, uh, again, shout out to Lars. He'd be a good guest for me to have. Yeah. Do you think he would dare? Do you think he would dare to speak English with me? Yeah, I think he would. If you give him a beer or two, he'll, he'll speak <laughs> in, any, in any language you want, I think. We can <laughs> try Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> give him enough Akavit, he'll speak any language. <laughs> I don't know these things. I don't know Lars that well. <laughs> He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah he, is. he is. Yeah, he is very well respected here in Norway. Mm. Um, one thing that impresses me also with Norway is your female powerlifters. They are crazy. You they guys are have so a strong. yeah. You guys have a very solid national team, both raw and equipped. Yeah, they are amazing lifters. I've trained with a lot of them for many years. Mm. Um, they are so impressive. You know, a lot of people are going to comment about how pretty they are, and they are pretty. But to not be sexist, I want to say first and foremost, they are very strong. That's what I. Yeah, <laughs> they're great, great athletes. They are. They're and very. They're great they're, athletes. I've told the uh, male uh, population of powerlifters in Norway, we have to step it up because they're making us look bad. Well, you they know, they are so dedicated. They are so strong. They're so talented. They work so hard. As a so, team, as a team on the world basis, don't they rank usually rank higher than the men's team? Yeah, they yeah. do. Yeah, they yeah. they are. Yeah, come on, and you guys, the, you guys better step last, it up. Last year was actually the first year in Norwegian powerlifting history that there were more women than men at powerlifting nationals. Think about that. That's kind of crazy. That's absolutely insane. But but I think that's a beautiful thing. That is a great thing because I can remember not that long ago, you know, 10 years ago maybe, where women across the board were just thinking, oof, powerlifting? Oof, never. You know, that was a thought. That was a thought with a lot of women that it was just a guy sport or that if women did it, they were going to turn into these big beasts uh, of a woman. And all I think, I think actually we can sort of, give some of the credit for females or women in powerlifting. We can give some of the credit to weightlifting and most of it, I think actually to CrossFit. CrossFit, uh, ma- many, of course. Yeah. 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 Many, many of the girls start uh, training because it's such a popular thing to do to train squats and uh, deadlifts and uh, yeah, weightlifting exercises. And many of them are 
smart and contact uh, powerlifting clubs because they yeah. are really we we are the ones with the knowledge about squatting. So well, you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of bad or negative things to say about CrossFit. I don't know too much about it, but what I do see is that those athletes and especially the women are extremely fit. And when they do cross over to powerlifting, they've they've got their stuff together. They know what they're doing. They're already strong. And they're, yeah, they're, they, are. They're, they are quite successful in powerlifting. And, and absolutely, they are a driving force behind the rise in the number of females that are taking part in powerlifting, especially here in Norway, I think. Yeah, and if you, if, uh, if you train in gyms, uh, I've trained in gyms in, in Norway since I was 16. Yeah. And when I was training at the age of 16, there were, might be one squat rack yeah. in a gym if you were lucky. Yeah. And there might be one or two barbells, uh, like 20 kilo barbells. Yeah. But if you can walk into any gym in Norway now, and there's like, if, if it's a decent sized gym, you have like between five to 15 squat platforms. Yeah, it, it's changed drastically. Yeah, and, and I not, can't... not just powerlifting gyms, but gyms in general. Gyms, period. I remember yeah. when I came here in uh, the year 2000 to visit my wife. We were just dating at the time, but I came here in 2000 for the first time. And, uh, you're right. There was, I think there was one squat rack, uh, you know, one of those old, uh, stupid squat racks, uh, just an old fashioned squat rack that could barely be used. So to go for like a homemade one. (laughs) Yeah. It was almost like a homemade one. So to go, to go and, and, you know, and, and nobody was deadlifting. Nobody, Mm -hmm. nobody knew anything about deadlifting back then. So to go from that to these gyms that are even, you know, forget about the powerlifting clubs, the commercial gyms are set up so that if, yeah, you're, they are. if you're a powerlifter, you, you can, you can slide right in there. Yeah. Uh, usually you can, if you're one of the strongest powerlifters like me, uh, you'll have kind of a hard time squatting on the, there's usually Olympic bars. For me, Olympic bars are quite a challenge. They, they are. Um, it, luckily for me, I say, and I say luckily for me, mm-hmm. I've had all of these shoulder injuries, so I don't squat with a straight bar any, anymore. I use exclusively uh, SSB, safety squat bar. Um, yeah, I remember. You, do you remember us talking about the safety bar on Instagram? Yes. A couple of years ago? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, that might that might have been when I first was con. It was right before that that I contacted you for the first time, and then we were talking about mm. the the safety squat bar. But um, yeah, so that was back in 2017, 2018, something like that. Yeah, something like that. I've used I've used the uh, SSB bar for yeah since my shoulder surgery in like yeah. I think that was about 2016 maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Since um since I've had all these shoulder trouble, I, I can't even remember the last time I had a regular block of training with straight bar squats. I think I've been using SSB almost exclusively since twenty sixteen. Yeah. Yeah. It's and a then, great bar. Uh, absolutely. It, it's what's given me my squat. It, it was it was very interesting, <clears throat> or it, it it has been very interesting because even though I haven't been straight bar squatting. Uh, and been do, using just the safety squat bar, my squat has grown exponentially. When I set the the Norwegian raw record, I squatted only two uh, two training sessions with a straight bar. That's, before that. that's actually kind of crazy. Other than that, it was just SSB. Yeah, but I can really relate. Uh, I know when I started SSB working in Norway, yeah. I know a lot of other. Athletes and clubs got really interested because they saw the development of my squat and my deadlift. Yep. And uh, most of that was contribu- contributed, I don't know the word. Contributed, uh, yeah. Yeah, to the squat, uh, the SSB bar. Yeah. It helped me a lot. Yeah, I, I try to tell people the same thing and, and people just kind of, you know, roll their eyes and walk away. But the, the, the main reason, in fact, the only reason for the good squat numbers that I have is that SSB bar. And you mentioned uh, deadlift as well. Um, I've cut out just about all supplemental exercises for deadlift, but I've gone from, uh, I had a very mediocre deadlift. The highest I had done in a meet was 287 and a half. But since I've been using SSB, uh, I've hit 325 in training on my deadlift. Yeah. That's just yeah. because of the SSB bar. So. Mm-hmm. It's helped me a lot. It's a great piece of equipment. Mm, it really is. We should start a commercial uh, for <laughs> SSB. 
<laughs> yeah, but I tell you, in, in, in all seriousness, I would not have the squat that I do. I would not have been able to, to, to set that record because if it wasn't for the SSB squat, then I wouldn't squat at all because I can't. I, I just I can't hold the bar with the shoulder the way it is. Mm, yeah, I can really relate to that. Uh, I know what it feels like to have a shoulder that's not cooperating. It's yeah. You're too young. You're too young for shoulder problems, man. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, knock on wood. I don't want to have shoulder problems anymore. It's, you feeling it's pretty no good fun. though? You feeling pretty yeah, good? I'm feeling pretty good in my shoulders. I'm a little bit stiff, but yeah, that's. Probably because of all the bench press training. It's not because of the shoulder surgery. Yeah, you know, you've you've got a good bench as well. You you're over aren't you you're over two hundred kilos, aren't you? Yeah, it's two hundred and sixteen and a half uh, in yeah. Namit. Yeah. Norwegian record. Oh you have the Norwegian record in that as well? I didn't know that. Yeah, I have it in uh, squat, bench press, deadlift and total. Yeah, I knew you all had the, I knew you had the deadlift in total. Yeah. yeah, your deadlift is just wicked, man. That's just uh, how much was it? Three, <laughs> three fifty-two and a half. Fifty-two and a half. Good gosh, uh, that's just amazing. <clears throat> I remember watching you and what's his name, uh, Eric Rön. Eric Rön, yeah. Uh, battle it out to see who was going to end up with uh, the record. That's some of the most exciting lifting I've ever seen in Norway. Yeah, I love that because he's he's uh, like 25 kilos heavier than me. Yeah. And he's a really strong young guy. Yeah. He's, uh, he's an amazing lifter. He's a maniac. What is he? He's only like 22, 21? 20? Yeah, 20, 22, 24, I'm not yeah. sure. I think, 20, I think he's past 23. Okay. Maybe it's 24, uh, but he's been strong for a long, long, long time. Oh, yeah. Work, he, was, he is working hard. He's uh, he's a maniac. I see him putting his Instagram videos up. He's outside in the middle of winter. Snow is literally blowing around his feet. And he's yeah. in his garage or his barn or whatever that is. It's training. kind of a, what's it called, a carport sort of. Okay, it's a carport. There's, there, I can yeah, never... there's, there's no walls. Uh, there's only yeah. one wall, I think. Yeah. And, where he lives, it gets like minus twenty degrees <laughs> Celsius in winter time. That's just no crazy. problem. And he's he's training with gloves yeah. and uh, three layers of yeah. clothing. clothing. <laughs> just he gets a, his work in. Just a maniac. There are not many people who have that kind of focus and drive to be training the way he does. If you guys could ever check this guy out, his name is Eric with a K. Rön, R-O-E-N. Check him out on Instagram. Yeah, I do so. He's amazing. It is it is so motivating. The guy is a maniac. Yeah, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, incre- he's an incredible lifter. Yes, he is. He yeah. is going to be, well, he already is a well-known lifter, but I think he's going to get a lot of international recognition. I think that guy is going to end up being a world champion before long. Yeah, that would be really cool. I would I really he enjoy it if he, yeah, yeah I think, yeah, he, he, He's got the drive in Absolutely. him. Absolutely, yeah. because he's, he's just really getting does. stronger and stronger. Mm. Yeah. And now, uh, yeah. Now, I wanted I wanted to ask you. We were you, you mentioned that you have a five year plan, but now, <clears throat> as we can see with this coronavirus, they're probably going to cancel Worlds. So that's just going to totally throw your five year plan out the window. What will you do to adjust? If they the cancel plan is, worlds. The plan is still on. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, luckily for me, uh, I'm kind of I'm, I've been struggling the last year with a minor injury in my back. Uh-huh. So uh, now I've sort of stepped back a couple of notches. Okay. Uh, and I'm working my ba- way back up to be able to handle decent amount of training volume again. Okay, so you've so simply I'm, been I've cutting down, off. cutting down on the volume for a while to let your back heal then. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've all of last year was kind of a struggle. Uh, I've I trained all my trainings, uh, but it was uh, I didn't add any kilos to my total last year because of uh, my back. Okay. Uh, yeah, it affected me uh, really badly. I so, see. Uh, yeah, but it was always there was always a new meet, a new world, a new Europeans, a new yeah. yeah. So I was kind of on the what's it called on the bandwagon or yeah was, just kind of rolling with it just yeah. to, well okay so if they cancel worlds this might be a good uh actually a good thing it might for me it'll probably be a good thing because i've kind of uh, uh 
I'm kind of relaxing right now. I'm training hard and I'm training smart, but I don't have any meets planned. No, no. For this year, um, uh, I'm just enjoying the process. And because of the coronavirus, uh, all of the gyms in Norway are closed. Yeah. Even at Olympia Toppen, that was a, uh, where I where train the most of my trainings. Training. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's even closed. So yeah. Uh, now, now do you have a good of, Do you have a good setup at home with some? Uh, yeah, it, I didn't be, uh, have, but uh, the because of this coronavirus, uh, I kind of got motivated to. I I have to do my work, my powerlifting work. So I bought and invested in a gym and made a gym in my basement. Yeah, I saw some pictures of that. That's like a, uh, it's not quite like Eric Rund, but it is kind of primitive, but it gets the job done. I saw you have, you, know, you have a little bench and every, it looked, looked kind of tight there. Do you have room? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, I think, honestly, I think it's probably one of the smallest powerlifting gyms <laughs> in the world, but it's exactly big enough for me. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. So uh, it's here in Oslo, the um, the prices of properties are incredibly high. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's sort of what I can afford. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make, unless I want to move outside the city, then I could probably buy my own barn to train in. But uh, I yeah. want to be here. It's close to my work. It's close to my girlfriend. Yeah. What is your work? What do you do? What's your nine to five? Um, I don't work nine to five, actually. Uh, I work um, several um, days in a row or several, what's it called uh, in Norwegian, Dane, several. Yeah, several days in a row. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. several days in a row. Uh, uh, and when I'm at work, I live at work. I work with um, children uh, that, what's it called, uh, that that's had a real tough upbringing. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're placed uh, in Mostly a... kids under the year, age of 12. Okay. Uh, they're placed uh, at my work. So when I'm at work, I'm kind of their, okay. not their parent, but their go-to adult. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I'm, I'm responsible for their well-being and uh, their daily life. It's a lot of responsibility, but you're the right it's kind of guy for that. But you're the right kind of guy for that. You just, you know, for the people that don't know you, I'm telling them that you're, you're just a nice guy. You're one of the nicest guys I've ever met here in Norway. Oh, thank you. So, much appreciated. Yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. And I, um, and I really love my job. Uh, I really, really love it. So, I used to do that work when I was living up in uh, northern Norway. I hired myself out to actually put it under my business that I had at the time. Yeah. And uh, I did that kind of work. Um, it's a mm -hmm. very demanding, <laughs> very demanding yeah, it's very, job. It could, can be really, really demanding, especially mentally. It can be really challenging. Yeah, and, and I, you work with children. So, yeah, it demands yeah. a lot of patience. Yeah, a lot of patience, a lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge. But I think that's good the way they do it, where you work so many days in a row, but then you get quite a few days off so that you can unwind yeah, and great. kind of get back to, to to normal in your mind. Yeah, it's great for my sort of lifestyle, my training. Yeah. Uh, when I'm, I get a week off at a time. I work for a couple of a uh, couple of days, and then I have a week off. So I'm. I feel like a professional athlete <laughs> and, and my weekends are kind of my work. Uh, it's awesome. That's a good feeling to have. Yeah, for me, it's perfect. I've deliberately done it like that because I've worked hard to get my job because not many people are lucky or good yeah. enough to get that job. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy that I got it and it's perfect for me. So Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, it takes a special kind of, it takes a certain caliber of a, of a person to work like that. Like I said, it, it demands a lot of patience. It's also, it also can be an emotional roller coaster. Uh, at least it was for me. You know, um, it's not always that when you have, when you're that, that, that support person uh, for a child or for a family in a difficult social situation, it's not all the time that you succeed with whatever you were trying to achieve. Very often uh, there's a failure there. And it yeah, can, you can often feel like sort of a failure, but if if you've been doing this for some time, you know that failure is kind of, it's, it's not personal. 
And yeah. as long as you're doing your best, uh, failure is always <laughs> going to happen anyway. It's part of the job. It's part of. Yep. You have to yeah, be able to separate part of life. Yeah. You have to be able to separate yourself to a certain degree. At the same time as you're putting your best efforts into it, you've got to separate yourself to a certain degree so you don't experience um, that downfall of failure in a personal way. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's it's important. It's really important, but it's also really difficult. <laughs> It is. It's not. It's not yeah. easy. <clears throat> it's very difficult. Um, what kind of a what kind of an education do you have to have uh, that job? I have uh, what's in Norwegian. It's called Barnevans Pedagog. Uh, okay, it's an education in child and family services. It's a bachelor's degree yeah. in yeah, sort of child and like it, a fam I, family I, social work is what it would be in, yeah. in English. Yeah, mm. family social worker. And I've got some other sort of uh, education but it's not that related it's more uh military <laughs> military based yeah how, how long were you in the norwegian military Oof, well, i've been in contract there for many years uh but um all together um, on and off for about five years mm -hmm. what's your rank you're not like a general do i need to no, salute, I'm not, salute you I'm nothing like that i'm nothing <laughs> like that I'm just uh, called, no, not uh, the, a Ganader in Norwegian. The, what that, that what it's rank? Just like an a, the, enlisted. It's that's like the third or fourth rank between corporal and uh, sergeant. I okay. Think. Okay. So, yeah. 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 Do you nothing uh, nothing fancy? Could you ever imagine yourself uh, making the military more of a consistent career or? And my plan was that and my, it was part of my five year plan when I was younger. Yeah. Uh, but I kind of I was in uh, sort of an accident at work. Uh, a grenade blew up uh, oh. really close to me. So I lost all of my hearing on my left side. So, so oh. it was kind of difficult for me to continue. I didn't know that. OK. No. So if I want to cuss you out and call you dirty names, I got to do it on the left side. <laughs> yeah, okay. please do. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> no, I, I didn't know that. Wow, that is that could have went a lot worse for you than yeah, it just. Could have, but uh, I was uh, I'm like halfway deaf, but uh, I can hear pretty good on my right hand side. But on my left side, it's almost completely gone. Wow, wow. I'm well. I'm glad you. I'm glad you made it through that. That could have. That could have went really bad. Wow. Yeah, but it was. I, it was. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, things happen. Now it's things happen, and yeah, it's in the past. So you just uh, you just keep on moving. You just keep on <laughs> getting I'm it always, done. I'm always I'm always moving forward. I just think that's awesome. You know, you you have, and and I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying something bad about Norwegians in general, but you seem to have more focus, more drive. And more of a desire to better yourself than most Norwegians. I I just have to say it. Just it's not often I that I Norwegians have this have this thing about them that they don't want to stick their head up above the crowd. They want to kind yeah, it's of called, in Norwegian it's called Janteloven. Janteloven, yeah. yeah, yeah. In Norwegian, yeah, uh, you're kind of most of, no, most Norwegians will kind of try to look down on you if you're yeah. one of the people that move forward and stick your head out and say stuff and and i think uh, yeah if I, you're in the media or, or yeah yeah i think but, you uh, you are noticeably different than most norwegians in, in that prob aspect I, i'm probably uh, you you are probably right uh, i'm i know that i'm kind of different where does that come from i've always had a drive to better myself to learn new stuff uh, i have an what's it called uh, i've i've never been diagnosed but uh, everybody who knew me when I was a little kid would say I, I've got some ADHD or okay. ADD or uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> a lot of energy. You know, and I've that may had very... a lot of energy, and I, I try to focus my energy and to doing positive stuff for me and for people around me. That's just, that's that, just beautiful. That's kind of what makes me tick. See, and that's the kind of stuff that makes me that makes me like you as a person. You just have that, that that. Like I said, it, it's it's just it's different. It's not typical Norwegian. You are not afraid to stick your head above the crowd, no. not in an arrogant way. You're just being yourself, but you stick your head out there and you do things differently. You say things differently. You have a different level of motivation and drive. 
Um, yeah, it's, to me, it's kind of uh, uh, I do some uh, do some uh, uh, Instagram work and social media stuff. Uh, I've been doing more of that lately, and some of my followers ask me, "Could you please?" do one series about how you stay motivated, how you work, how you do what you do, uh, because uh, they find it really inspiring. To, yeah. uh, because people want uh, it that people want that stuff. They yeah, want to be motivated. Want it, but to me, uh, to me, it's kind of, it's almost difficult to talk about because it's so emotional to me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a very emotional uh, human being. So to me, uh, yeah, Everything I do is kind of like uh, uh, a real, uh, it's a drive uh, so deep uh, within me. It's just, it's not an option to quit. I totally understand that. Yeah. I, I am the exact same way. Um, I had to teach myself to allow myself to be openly emotional. Mm. Um, there's no weakness in that. It's quite the opposite. It takes a certain amount of strength to allow yourself to be openly emotional. You know, I do it with this podcast. I do it. Mm. Oh, I definitely do it with the music that I, that I write. Um, and it, it, it uh, exposing that emotion is to me, it's kind of special. Uh, and you're not, you're even more of a man in my opinion, absolutely. if you can show emotions and if you can, uh, cry if you can yeah, yep. be happy and uh, it makes you a better human being uh, I love it I wish more men were saying that I, I, I love most, it man. most men are kind of scared to show emotion yeah, they're not, I think so they don't have the confidence or the I don't know if it's confidence or self esteem or uh, it, it is of, it's yeah. both yeah yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really really uh, confident in who I am and I think that helps me a lot uh and expressing feelings and in sort of speaking my mind. But where, where does that come from though? I mean, you, you say you've always been that way, but there must, I mean, uh, yeah, I've learned a lot of stuff from, especially from my mother. We spoke about our mothers when yes. they were uh, young. <laughs> yeah. When earlier in the podcast, we spoke about them. So yeah, we my did. mother yeah. is really special to me and also my grandfather. Okay. Is your grandfather still yeah. alive? No, he's unfortunately not, but okay. uh, he was a real special kind of guy. Yeah. How so? Uh, he was kind of, my parents, uh, when we grew up, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, mm. So uh, they worked constantly all the time. So I, usually I was at my grandfather's house uh, with him. Yeah. If, uh, they lived like five minutes apart. So. Uh -huh. I spent most a lot of my childhood at his place, uh, and the uh, sort of um, he had like an aura around him, uh, sort of respect and mutual respect uh, okay. to all kinds of people. I see. Uh, that was so inspiring to me because even after his death, like. 10, 15 years after he died, people are coming to me in the streets of Lingdal, where I come from. Uh -huh. and they're telling me, I remember Kalle. Kalle uh, is the name of my grandfather. I yeah. really remember him. Uh, he was such a great guy. He was such an inspiration because he was always in a good mood. He talked to everybody. No one was more worth than anybody else. Wow. See, he was one of, he was one of the first, he was, um, he was a sailor for many years. Mm-hmm. Uh, worked uh, in a lot of ships internationally uh, abroad. Yeah. Uh, so he did a lot of traveling, and he was one of the first uh, people in Lingdal who contacted all uh, m many of the first immigrants that came to Lingdal. Okay. And invited them home to his place for coffee and helped them to find work. He did See, lots, now that's, lots of stuff. Yeah. That's special because it wasn't everyone who welcomed immigrants with open arms back in those days. There was a lot of skepticism. Not, and, and I don't want to say racist. And there still is. <laughs> See, I was going to try and be nice and not say <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I'll so, speak my mind. He'll speak your mind. <laughs> but but uh, but in all seriousness, that is a big thing because back in those days, it was not. People were scared. <laughs> people were scared and confused about yeah, this whole phenomenon. Experienced, experienced it a lot more than me because your skin color is different than mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'm going to have a, a podcast coming up where I where I take on that subject of, of racism specifically mm. racism and I'm going to take that up but yes uh, it is unfortunately racism is a thing 
here in Norway. Uh, I have a story that I told how when my wife and I first moved here in 2002, we were, uh, and my wife is Norwegian. <coughs> mm. So, yeah, that's a whole other thing. I was going to say something else. But, but what happened was when we came here and we were looking for a house to buy, uh, we on three different occasions that I can remember were stopped from buying the house that we wanted because I'm a black guy that's, and people will that's say, so and, pe- crazy. And, and if people wonder, how do I know that? Well, the thing is, is of course, when we first came here, I couldn't speak Norwegian. Now I speak fluent Norwegian, but at that time I mm. couldn't speak Norwegian. This was right when we got here. So we would go to these house uh, showings that were for sale mm. and we would be speaking English between us, my wife and I. Yeah. So the uh, the real estate agent and the homeowner, of course, then would assume that we couldn't speak Norwegian. So Ugh. my wife would hear them saying things like, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't sell this house to that black son of a bitch. We don't want to ruin the neighborhood, you know, th- things like that. Ugh. And that happened on three different occasions that I can remember. Well, that makes me so mad. And this was in this was in two thousand two, two thousand and three in Norway. This wasn't like nineteen sixty in uh, the southern United States. This it was, was here. In was Norway. it in sort of the outskirts of Norway? Or was it? Uh, one house in Sunda. Mm-hmm. One in Sylling, Lier. Um, and one in like Vestfold, was it, or was it maybe in Vestfold, somewhere else in Vestfold, not Sonda, but somewhere else in Vestfold. Yeah. So yeah, in, in the, in the outskirts of the city. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I don't want to talk down on any Norwegian people, but I've experienced lots and lots of racism as well. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. One of my exes, she was uh, originally from Tanzania. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we lived together for a couple of years and uh, yeah, uh, experienced a lot of strange things. Uh, well, it's very interesting. My wife tells me how um, in her social circles, it doesn't happen so much now because people know that she's married to me, you know, this, this black American. Mm-hmm. But before people knew what her husband, what color her husband was, she, you know, people would speak very openly about what they thought about black people or about foreigners. And she would just kind of take all of this in and hear these people saying these terrible things about foreigners. And she would let them talk for a long time. And then she would say, yeah, and you know, my husband is a black guy, right? And then that was her revenge is to see the look on their faces when they realize what an ass they've been speaking so ugly about foreigners all this time when my wife is actually married uh, to me, a black guy. So yeah. it, it's it's out there. Unfortunately, it's out there. Mm. What I do is just I'm, I I make a conscious decision. I made this decision of years ago when I was a kid to not let racism affect me. Or well, it affects me. It hurts my feelings. It can make me angry. But to not let racism hold me back from achieving the goals that I want to yeah. achieve, yeah, I just that's, refuse. That's, I refuse yeah. to let that happen. And I think also in, especially in many places in Norway, I think racism is kind of an expression of, uh, not to excuse anyone, but lack of knowledge, uh, I think is Well, to a, to a certain extent, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, immigration or, 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 you know, foreigners in Norway, it hasn't been happening for that long. It only was in the early 70s that we started to get uh, foreigners here in Norway. And, I, and my response is, well, how long does it take? You know, 1970? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's 50 years ago, for God's sakes. How long does yeah. it take for you to realize that people are people and... Yeah, so I I just don't go for that argument that it's no, only I'm been not, such a short yeah, time. I love it. I love it. Uh, it's getting. Uh, I love it that uh, you say it that way. Because, yeah. 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 Uh, and I figure. How long does it take? Yeah. That's yeah. You a good know. One. Or, but I or think most. I've, I've I throughout my work and throughout my life I've experienced a lot of different kind of people. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the people who were really. Uh, really racist, uh, knowingly and openly, uh, probably never even met or spoke to anyone with a different yeah, color yeah, than their yeah, own. Yeah, and there's the ignorance of it all. Yeah, <clears throat> there's the ignorance of it all. Mm. Um, 
you know, I don't care how a person was raised. You can be raised to be a racist and that's not your fault, but you become an adult at some point. You become a person who should be a little bit more aware. And if you as an adult choose to continue to be racist, well, then I don't think there's too much hope for you. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. There's no reason to be. Yeah. What are you doing there in the background? You making dinner? No, I'm just uh, saving. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't think you could hear it. I'm, I'm just uh, saving some of my leftovers. Hey, anything that has to do with food, my antenna goes up. I knew something was happening with food in the yeah, background. You could smell it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting some of the, the leftovers from my dinner. I always make like huge dinners, so I have leftovers for later. Yeah, yeah. I'm just putting in the putting them in a box to put in the fridge. See, you stick into the plan. Stick yeah. into the plan. <laughs> Always stick into the plan. <laughs> so in the course of this conversation that you and I have had, <clears throat> I've gotten proof of a few things that I kind of assumed without knowing you all that well. I th- always figured you were a guy who was very focused on what you do. I always figured that you were a sensitive guy in a way that most people would not associate with being a power lifter. Um, uh, I, I assume that you were a guy who has a history of being focused, of being goal driven. And all of those things have just been confirmed through this conversation that I've had with you. Yeah. So great. I'm so smart. I'm such a good judge of character. <laughs> yeah, you're the best judge of character. <laughs> it's uh, nothing to do with the fact that I'm kind of pretty open on social media. Pretty, <laughs> pretty open. You've met me a couple of times. I'm well, not that hard to read. <laughs> no, you're not. You're, you're 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 so straightforward, and that and that's and I <laughs> yeah. say that uh, in in a good way, in a complimentary way. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's fantastic to see. Um, I don't know. I, I, I try to do what I can to expose the fact that power lifters don't necessarily have to be a loud mouth meathead. You know, we are very dynamic. We have, <laughs> we have hearts, we have brains, we yeah. do have views on world events. We're not meatheads that just power lift and that's it. You're so right on that point. There's so many incredibly smart people yeah. uh, in powerlifting. You know, and it's just a, it's just a bonus to be smart and physically fit. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just, it uh, it's just a bonus. Yeah. It's really a great bonus. Well, listen, man, I uh, want to thank you for giving me uh, a little bit over an hour. It's been an hour and 12 minutes now, an hour and 12 minutes of your time. Um, I want to I, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. I, you know, and I want to, I want to tell people also, can you tell us how they can find you on Instagram? Because you mentioned you're starting a new video series. I've already seen the first video. Uh, I don't know if you've done another one since I saw the one, but you did one video where you were talking uh, uh, about some of your experiences. Yeah, actually, up, I uploaded one video right before you called me also from okay. my first powerlifting meet. Okay. So, I'll have with to, commentary from me. Okay. I'll have to check yeah. that out. Now, I want people to know, my listeners to know that when you do these videos on your Instagram, they're in Norwegian, but I have some Norwegian listeners. So how, how can they find you on Instagram? Uh, in Norwegian, it's Stärkepetter. It's S T E R K E. P E T T E R. Okay. Stärke Petter. It's the Norwegian strong yep. Peter. And yeah. for the non-Norwegian speakers, check him out on Instagram just to see his training videos and whatnot. It's very motivating. But for those of you who speak Norwegian, go in and check out his new video series where uh, Carl Petter is telling a little bit more about himself, and uh, it can be a good way for people to get to know you. Yeah, you can also find me on YouTube. Just Google my name. Carl Petter Somerset. Yeah, and for, find the, me. for the English speakers, that's C A R L P E T T E R S O M M E R S E T H. Carl Petter Somerset. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I want to I want to send as many people to you as as possible. You deserve uh, recognition for what you do. I really appreciate it, John. You're such a nice guy. That's my mother's fault. <laughs> hey thank you so much for doing this and i will talk to you again soon but thank you so much for doing this episode 
Thank you, John. My pleasure. Okay, my friend. Yeah. We'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk. Okay. Hopefully I'll see you soon. We'll do a barbecue or something. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, yeah. my brother. Talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Okay, everybody. Carl Petter Somerset. I love that guy. He's so much more than a power lifter. I want to thank you all for coming into this episode of the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Bye now. I'm coming home. Oh. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Yes, I am, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Lord, I'm coming home. Thank you.